Our next speaker is uh, Sue Johnston Wilder from University of Warwick. Um, she's going to keep going on the math anxiety theme, and she's going to introduce a math resilience framework that has been found to be accessible to teachers, parents, support staff, uh, learners, in order to reduce the negative impact on student learning in, in relation to math anxiety. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. So um, I'm delighted to be following Flavia and uh, Maria's talks. They've laid the foundation of what it is we have to do today if we're working on maths anxiety. And this quote, something must be done, came from a, a further education teacher in England at a seminar where we were who hadn't yet heard of the Maths Resilience Network. The logo on the bottom right is the logo we created last summer when we launch the network and the proceedings of that third international conference are available if you want a copy, please just ask. So I'm um, partly going to take a teacher's look at why mass anxiety is so prevalent. And then as a teacher, I want to begin to understand what we can do about it for ourselves and for our students. And our approach is rooted in positive psychology and, and part of what I want to share is a three-level model for developing staff expertise for dealing with mass anxiety across the UK, Ireland, Turkey, Brazil, South Africa, and wherever else we find teachers willing to work with us on this global problem, as Flavia told us. So we've heard from Flavia and from Maria about the definition of mass anxiety. The key point in Ashcraft's definition is that it interferes with maths performance. And the logical consequence of that is that if we deal with maths anxiety, we will have a lot of people making a lot more progress in mathematics. Um, I wanted to show you this slide. We've talked about prevalence. Um, this slide is from one of my PhD students measuring maths anxiety with a group of year sevens in a secondary school in the middle of England. Um, and the score goes from 10 to 50. And what I wanted to point out is that mass anxiety is a spectrum from low, medium, high, and severe. Um, and even in the year sevens, it affects um, quite a lot of children. But it's not easy to tell from that graph who needs intervention and who's actually fine. And so part of what I'm going to share with you is learning to distinguish between nervousness and panic. Um, because actually, for example, now I'm nervous, but I can perform well, I can still think, and it's the point at which you stop being able to think that you're in a state where the mass um, performance is affected. So um, it affects learners, parents, teachers, and support staff in schools and colleges. And so you'll find when you're working with um, any student that you may even have, they may have even picked off the maths anxiety from their support staff. And when we work with further education teachers, an awful lot of the non-maths staff have maths anxiety. So we need to be working there as well as with the learners, parents and teachers. It's contagious, and that's the point of Flavia and Maria's comments about if you don't leave it attended to, then that the adults pass it on to the children, whether it's through being a parent or whether it's being through a, a teacher. It's prevalent across the world, and we've got Telma here from Brazil, which showed up on that graph that Flavia showed as low scoring and high maths anxiety. And the real point of today is it's often ignored or dismissed, even though it's impairing the progress of about a third of our population. So I would start by saying that learners start out naturally curious, and I have the delight of being a new grandmother, my granddaughter is 15 months old. She is clearly very curious about anything that we show her. And that fear is learned. Um, even the fear of spiders is learned. And I was pleased to see that Flavia found an equation there. The only innate fears include um, fear of being dropped and that the baby's born with. Um, things that cause fear become avoided. And when you combine that with a cultural fixed mindset you end up with a lot of people telling you, I'm not a maths person. So I met a lovely lady who was working in the mental health industry um, in England, and I explained to her that I trained and worked with maths teachers, and she did that. And I said, what happened to you? 
And she said, I've never thought about it like that. And so what we need to be asking anyone who avoids maths is what happened to you? And that ties in with Maria's self, uh, 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 maths own experiences stories. So one of the things I want to try and talk about is a human being spectrum um, that's represented here but in disguise. So Nadine Stewart did a study with um, youngsters aged about 16 in England who wanted to leave maths behind and not study maths after they were 16. And they described maths in such a way that Nadia and Stuart um, summarised as tired. I've changed it to tried, because I'm working with FE teachers. We tried that, now we're going to try something different. And the, the, the leavers described the maths that they'd experienced as tedious, rote, isolated, elitist, and depersonalised. And I was used to sharing that um, acronym with my PGCE students, and then I met a young man and chatted with him about it. And he said, well, that's because I like maths that way. And he redefined those terms. He said that maths is predictable, individual, prescribed. Oh, I'm good at it. And there's no confusing context. And I realized that what this is saying to me is that the human being spectrum has a spectrum on the left from the um, systemizers, the people who like logic, and on the right the um, empathisers who like um, values more, or, or, or prefer to think from values. And these dichotomies are manifest in Jung's work, in Myers-Briggs, and in Simon Baron cohens work. And part of the rationale uh, for me of the growth mindset is you start off with one preference or the other as a child, and then if you're not put in a box, you develop the other part of your brain as an older member of society. I'm not quite sure exactly when, but if we put little children in boxes and say, well, you're the maths person and you're the English person, we end up losing a third of the population to the other. And so um, with, with, with Myers-Briggs, for example, and with Jung, he's very keen on the notion of maturation. Carol Dweck and Joe Bowler are very keen on the idea of growth mindset. We're not stuck in a box. If we use it, it grows. So now I want to encourage you to think about maths anxiety through the lens of trauma and adverse experience. Um, and this was mentioned both by Flavia and um, by Maria. Um, and it kind of highlights to us how important it is to understand that the learners are bringing these experiences with us and we don't know what's going to trigger a memory from the past thinking about your own experience, as Maria asked you to do, there will be positive experiences of learning, whether it's maths or anything else, and there will be negative experiences of learning. And in my case, much to the amusement of the support staff I work with, my negative experiences around cooking. And of course, they can all do cooking, and they think it's quite funny that I can't do cooking. And I mirror it back and say, well, I think it's quite unusual that you can't do maths, but let's have a look at our experiences, and what is it that's put us off this, this fundamental human activity. So um, the first two of these quotes come from people who've come to Warwick um, in, the, in the widening participation um, sort of side of our work, where we don't take traditional high-achieving students. We reach out for those who've had bad starts. And you can see that being called stupid, feeling you are stupid, features quite high. Molly is a different... A student. She came to do a master's, but she wanted to be a teacher. She couldn't pass the teacher test in the UK because of her maths anxiety. So she studied maths anxiety with me and maths resilience as part of her master's. And her history, her story, was that it was her dad who would grab her around the neck when he was trying to help and she couldn't understand. So, so sometimes it's physical threats, but more often it's social threats. And Dr. Marianne Trent said... If you're dealing with an invisible enemy, that invisible monster that Flavia's video mentioned, it's really hard to turn the threat radar down because you can't, you can't locate it. You can't easily make it shrink. You've got to actually um, work quite hard with invisible threats. And the term mass monster I first met when we ran a lovely course at Warwick for um, adult staff who are frightened of maths. We called it mass for chocolate, which is one way of getting people into the room. And the lady at the end said, thank you for rescuing me 
from the mass monster. But I think we need to do some work to understand what this mass monster is before we can ask people to forget about it. So mass anxiety is acquired. It's disabling. And now I'm going to get a little bit passionate about this. It's been written about since the 1950s. It now affects large numbers of people. If you get RESIT students, um, again, I'm from England, you, you, you offer all the, research, the, the FE students a chance to RESIT mathematics. You don't deal with the anxiety, and you get a 20% pass rate, and some of those youngsters go backwards. And I'm going to present that as a massive waste of the students' lives, the economy, and the teachers' time. We're totally wasting resources, and we don't need to do it anymore because it can be addressed. And as, as the previous speakers have spoken about, quite often you're dealing with psychology at the beginning and not mathematics. And I'm going to look at the reasons behind this. Okay, so in terms of if you're teaching maths, we need to understand that the brain seeks to distinguish challenge from threat to well-being or survival. So we're dealing with a very, very powerful, but in places very, very primitive organ. And if the um, learner has experienced physical or social threats, then the brain won't like anything associated with those. And the kind of things that interpreted as social threats are being left behind, being humiliated, or being shouted at. Now, a lot of young people, a lot of parents, a lot of adults have had experiences of being left behind in a maths class, or humiliated, or shouted at. And those previous threats are remembered by the, the, the alarm part of the brain, and so the brain perceives the threat, goes into fight or flight mode. And a little example of a physical left behind. I came, come today, walked from the hotel with walking sticks. I was very frightened of being left behind. Um, obviously, I'm with a kind group of people who might wait for me and then make us all late. But if I got left behind and left out, then my survival is at risk because I don't know anybody in Dublin, and it's quite a threatening situation. So my brain's wanting to protect me from that. So we coined the phrase mathematical resilience as a stance towards mathematics that, uh, le that pupils learn and adults learn in order for them to continue learning despite these adverse prior experiences. And quite a lot of what I'm going to talk about um, is underpinned by psychological safety. And that is every teacher's job, the same as physical safety is every teacher's job. So... Learning requires psychological safety. In order to feel psychologically safe, you need, or the learner needs, relatedness, a sense of belonging in that math, maths environment, autonomy to be able to say if a task is too hard or if, if, if something's a, a hidden barrier for them, and competence, um, which rooted in the UK move towards mastery education. But... Um, my colleagues and I would like to include competence to self-safeguard. And I'm thinking about learners as young as 10 years old who, in the school, when they're talking about tables tests, the teacher might point to you and say, what are seven eights, in front of all the other children? And the child was starting to stammer. And what I showed her in terms of her competence to self-safeguard was that she didn't have to answer that question. She could be defiant and she could just stay stum stum. And she did that. And the teacher was then asking mum what was going on. Mum explained what was happening, because I didn't have direct access to the school, only to the family. And the practice of pointing at this child and asking them what seven eights were in front of all her other peers stopped for a while. For some reason, I don't understand. It came back again. And the next time it happened, um, Summer ran to the toilet and hid in the toilet. Because she knew that her maths well-being was at risk, and she felt able to do that and to go and protect herself from this poor, in, indeed, unsafe practice. And this competence to self-safeguard, I'm going to suggest, can be achieved by using three tools I'm going to share with you. The growth zone model, the hand model of the brain, and the, the relaxation response. And what we've discovered, working with teachers and parents and support staff and learners, is that these tools can help improve the dialogue about emotions when they get in the way and it imp improves the responses within the classroom or in the support um, area 
to address, reduce and tackle maths anxiety. So, mathematical resilience, um, we partly need to understand the emotional response to the threat. We then need tools to deal with it, some of which Maria's already uh, mentioned. We need to reinterpret the experience and then we need to develop tools to thrive in what I'm going to call the growth zone. So the first tool I would like everybody to know about, and I was interested to see that it appeared in the trauma-informed practice um, document from the Scottish Government, is Dan Siegel's Hand Model of the Brain. It's so simple, it's beautiful. If you imagine representing your brain by your hand, left side, right side of the hemisphere, let's just look at one side for now, and you think about this part of the brain that does the mathematics is represented by the fingernails. And if you open your brain and look inside, inside the thumb represents the alarm system, the amygdala, the hippocampus, that part of the brain, which is very old and primitive, and it's kept crocodiles alive for 100 million years. So it's very efficient at what it does. And normally, when you're listening to a lecture and you're not feeling threatened... You're taking everything in, the noises from the environment and the, the smells and, the, and the, the sights and the words I'm talking, which are quite high-level, complex ideas, and it's all going in together and being processed incredibly efficiently. But if a fire alarm were to go off or a tiger were to come into the room, you wouldn't be able to hear me. You'd be focused on the threat, and this part of the brain would go offline effectively. And the, the key part of this message when we translate this from Dan's work into our work, is you're not stupid at maths, you're panicking. If we can deal with the panic, which is temporary, you can do the maths. But we've got to deal with the panic first. So Dan, um, when you send the slides around, you'll see this. Dan's um, got a lovely video explaining his model, and he uses it with parents. He uses it with children as young as six. I've made a, a kind of um, informal version in my kitchen explaining how it works with mathematics, and I'd urge you to make your own version to explain this and get the learners to make versions to explain, because it's so important. You're not stupid, you're panicking. And panic is temporary. So then there's this researcher called Herbert Benson, and his book in, from 2000 is beautiful. He's taken 40 years of his um, life as a doctor to bring the relaxation response into Western culture. So it counters the fight-or-flight response that you have as an initial response when you meet this threatening environment, and you learn how to slow down your breathing rate, relax your muscles, and reduce your blood pressure. Does it happen that there's anybody in the audience who dives, does subaqua swimming or anything like that? Yeah? So you might recognise, sir, that if you're in trouble, you have to slow down your breathing to not use up too much oxygen. And so divers are taught how to do this. I think all people should learn how to do this before they start learning mathematics. And, I'm, and when I introduced this to some teachers of English who were maths anxious, um, they said they knew about self-soothing, but they hadn't thought about applying it to the maths anxiety problem. So it's about getting over that gap between things that we know how to do and applying them in mathematics. So here's the growth zone model. We all know the comfort zone. Agreed? That's an expression. I'm in my comfort zone. I'm out of my comfort zone. The point here is that there are two spaces outside the comfort zone, growth and anxiety. And I might call them challenge and threat. And both of them, when you step out of your comfort zone, make you a bit nervous. So if I take you climbing up these walls with a rope ladder, you might get a bit nervous. Or you might totally panic because it's outside any, anything you've ever done before and you don't think it's safe. The difference between the growth and anxiety is whether your brain thinks you've got the resources to cope with it or not. So the brain has a two-step evaluation. Whoops, you're outside your, growth zone, your comfort zone. Are you in challenge or are you in threat? If you think you've got the resources to manage, you stay in the, in the orange zone. If you think you're out of, the, um, out of your depth, basically, you panic. Okay. And what we have to learn is the difference between those two things and not call them both maths anxiety. And this is not new thinking. We've known for a long time that there are two kinds of anxiety-provoking situations. Those you can solve on your own, 
but you might need assistance, and those where the teacher or the adult or the, or the other needs to intervene because the person is um, not able to cope effectively at all, and you dive in and rescue them. But you don't dive in and rescue somebody who's in the orange zone. So I wish we'd called the red zone panic rather than anxiety, and since we started this in 2008, um, we've found other people who use this kind of model, and they call it comfort stretch panic, and that, that kind of thing. Um, so when we introduce this growth zone model to people, somehow it makes sense to them. These are ordinary people off the street. They're not academics. They can understand it. They learn to accept the feeling of stupidity in the red zone as temporary. They learn how to get out of the red zone. They build experience of being in and extending the orange zone, because otherwise you get learners in maths who say, I go straight from green to red, miss. I don't have an orange zone in maths. And that's partly because we think of maths as right or wrong and don't focus on the journey of learning mathematics. And we also need to encourage learners to creep out of their comfort zone. So the comfort zone, where a lot of people who are highly talented spend their time in maths, is where they can get everything right. They build self-confidence, they build confidence in the teacher, they learn to automate things, and they get 10 out of 10. That is not where a lot of growth is happening. That's restricting, um, and the danger is if you try to protect learners, you keep them in the green zone, not the orange zone. The red zone, I love the idea from a 10-year-old, is the bit that I can't reach yet, even with support, and your mathematical well-being is under threat. And there's a lovely article which a mother wrote about the daily fight with her 10-year-old about the maths homework. Not doing that, it's maths homework. And instead of fighting with the child, the child asked to see the circle diagram and said, this task is in my red zone, I want a task that's in my orange zone. Um, and if you're in that space, little to no useful learning takes place. So as we've said, we're not stupid, you're panicking, we need to understand this state is temporary, and that builds the resilience. So the growth zone, where you've experienced challenge, there's enough safeguarding you can make the mistakes that Maria talked about. You can learn from them. You can get it not quite right. You can get it completely wrong, but you've had a go. What is it you tried, and why did you think it was a good idea, and how can you grow from that point? You can require support. And part of the problem with mass learning is that we don't use enough support. We do not develop this growth zone effectively in mathematics. And so you either get it right or you get it wrong. There's no growth space. So what we need to include in this growth space, based on the things that we've said before, a growth mindset, a belief that if I have a go, my, my brain is going to grow that other side, but neurons take time to grow and they need practice. A, bit, a willingness to struggle, which kind of comes with a growth mindset according to Dweck's work. The value, understanding why this is important to me, and it's connected to my values. And I'm not just doing it because the teacher said so, because that's extrinsic motivation. And the support and relatedness and being able to recruit support whenever you feel like you've got into your orange zone. Just for completeness, I want to mention the blue zone. Because I was talking about maths anxiety, I kind of hid the blue zone inside the, the, the green zone. But there is a four zone model that's very prevalent in the world out there that you will find. And I found this image of it um, so the zones they call mad, sad, calm, and brave. Um, and this is a diagram which represents, are they negative or positive emotions, and are they low energy or high energy? And so the blue kind of completes that particular diagram. Um, in our group, we haven't researched the impact of this on, on people the same as we have the growth zone model. Um, I do know that there's a self-regulation model out there that is slightly different and wants youngsters to stay in the green zone, and so it's interpreting the emotions very differently. We do want maths to be exciting and challenging and engaging, which is the positive, um, pleasant um, zone, which is brave. How do you get out of the red zone? Well, Benson's trick uh, explained about the relaxation response. Stopping and eating something, rest and digest, triggering the parasympathetic nervous system, Trying five, seven breathing, five in, seven out. Focusing on five things you can hear. Going for a walk. So in a classroom, you might give the child a red card and allow them to go for a walk whenever they need to get out of the, of the mass lesson. 
and a bit of micro-mindfulness, um, by which I mean the sort of mindfulness you can use in a maths classroom. Um, obviously, you can go to the one-to-one -one support people for more of this, but I'm looking at what maths teachers can do, and I've got South African teachers using some of these strategies in classes of 60. So I don't see why we can't all do it. If we say, how are you feeling? If I ask you all now, how are you feeling? Which zone are you in? If you did that, we'd carry on. If you did that, we'd pause and model having a two-second break while you calm down a bit. But don't try to do maths while your brain is focused on the maths monster. Um, Maria's already covered this. How do you build the amber zone, the growth zone, using the internet, making mistakes? But things like using rough work. When I work with the teachers, quite often the children expect to put the right answers in their maths book and they haven't got any space for rough work. And so they go away and put paper tablecloths on the table or they give them rough working books or they give them um, those kind of whiteboards that you can rub out. And you need to expect to make mistakes in that growth space and to have a go, but not necessarily to know what you're doing, because you're building your brain while you do it. So I've offered you a means to help learners understand and articulate their feelings quite promptly, and so a learner, once they've learnt this model, will say, Miss, I've gone into the red zone, um, and a means to self-safeguard, um, and also to up for us to safeguard the mathematical well-being of those in learned, in, involved in learning mathematics or supporting them. And one of the things that some of the teachers will do is put this dark diagram on the table and the learner will put a, pen, a penny in the zone they're in and the staff will go over to the child in the, in the classroom. If the penny's in the red zone, they'll ask them what they're going to do to calm down. They won't start talking mathematics. If the penny's in the orange zone, they'll ask them some mathematical questions, ask them what sort of help they need. And if the penny's in the green zone, they might ask them how they're going to challenge themselves a little bit. There is a fourth tool, which we really like, which some teachers have found incredibly helpful. We've got less research on the efficacy of this tool. I offer it to you anyway, um, because of, of the reactions we've had when we have had them. This is a diagram of two people trying to learn mathematics. One of them has enough rungs to get from the bottom to the top. Thank you very much, I'm up here. The other one has not got enough rungs because the teacher, who's an expert in the subject, hasn't remembered or doesn't know, doesn't have the pedagogic content knowledge to break down the, the, the concept that's being conveyed into smaller steps. So I've got an example of Molly, who's, whose anxiety started around learning times tables. What's seven eighths? Um, and with her, we went right back to um, drawing a bar of chocolate. This is where the mass of chocolate comes in. Suppose it's six by four. How many pieces of chocolate are there in that bar? Okay, let's add them all up. It's 24. Put that in the bottom right-hand corner, and then let's draw another bar of chocolate. That's maybe three by four. How many bars, pieces of chocolate in that bar? 12. And now if we carry on that process, we're going to build our times table square, and we're connecting times table with the idea of an array with rows and columns. And somehow that's got missed out in the learning process for the young people, and it completely changes their relationship to the times tables. And we've done that lots of times with ad adults with maths anxiety, and they've gone on, in Molly's case, to be a head of geography in a local school. The three-level CPD model I want to share with you, if I've still got time, um, is based on the Scottish trauma-informed practice model, um, Holmes and Grandison, 2021. And what they propose, we've changed it from trauma to anxiety awareness, even though I would suggest that some of these young people have actually experienced something we might call trauma, like being drab, grabbed around the neck, that what we need in our communities at level one is a lot more awareness of maths anxiety, how to recognise it, as Maria mentioned, and how to resist causing further harm by referring that person to somebody who knows what to do next. But, but please not to try teaching the maths if they're presenting with maths anxiety, which 80% of English FE students are doing. And it's either by being angry, because they're in the red zone, any negative high arousal, um, protesting, throwing chairs, avoiding the lesson, that's more of the blue bit perhaps. But any of that non-positive behaviour is likely an indicator that there's been some adverse prior experiences. Then we need in every institution some people who know about anxiety-informed practice 
And I'm going to propose until we get another model that the growth zone um, model and the mass resilience framework can be shared with practitioners quickly and efficiently and enables the, the teachers to work slightly differently with their learners. Trauma-informed practice and anxiety-informed practice involves safety. So the youngsters who won't come to your math support sessions, how do they know that when they get there, they're going to be safe? Because trust me, they weren't safe before. Why should they come now? There's a big message to be got out about how you're going to make them safe, how you're going to build trust, how you're going to give them choices, how you're going to work collaboratively with them, and how you're going to empower them. Then the other thing that was mentioned was the importance of self-efficacy by Flavia. Um, Bandura himself talked about resilient self-efficacy, that personal belief that you can do maths even when your well-being has been threatened before or now, that you can know what to do to keep yourself safe and keep going, whether it's to ask a different teacher, to excuse yourself from the lecture, to go online and ask about the concept, to keep asking questions, whatever it is, that you have that inner belief that if somebody is letting you down, it's not your brain that's the problem. And Bandura proposed four sources of self-efficacy. He, um, he, he, he found that the learners developed self-efficacy when they succeeded, when they saw similar people to them succeeding, when the tutor believed in them and, and, and persuaded them that they could have a go, and also this psychological, uh, physiological um, monitor that's going on in the body all the time that says, yeah, you can do this, and learning to interpret that. So all of those back up what I've just been saying. The importance of autonomous motivation cannot be underestimated. These learners, it's no good saying, when they say, why are we studying Pythagoras theorem? Why are we studying quadratics? Why are we studying div, grad, curl, and all that? To have no sense of why this is valuable, if it's not interesting and intrinsically interesting, we've got to tap into their values. Yeah, doctors use this because... Um, or nurses use this because we need to know as maths teachers an awful lot more about the applications of the mathematics that we're teaching and their social uh, relevance as well as why they're important intrinsically. So in Telma and my last article, we, we slightly enhanced the growth zone model. We haven't tested this yet, so you're the first people to, to test it with. Um, we're summarising the, the core elements of the orange zone into four parts. And you'll see that the value and autonomous motivation, why are we doing this, is in the top left part. Collaboration and struggle is in the right-hand part, not just I can either do it or I can't. The bottom right, learning from mistakes and developing your growth mindset. And the bottom left, relatedness of community and peers, all learning and support each other and not leaving anybody behind. So when we first started... Um, we, 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 we discovered a lot of work had been going on with psychologists, but there wasn't enough going on with teachers, students, parents, and support staff. And we started to develop a research area. We went to a webinar that you might be interested to catch up on, presented by the German journal ZDM last week. And what they said was, it's much easier to study psych uh, mass anxiety than it is to study interventions. And that's why there's not a lot of research going on in interventions if you want to get published. So I'm walking away from, the, from, from that area. What we've done is developed a 24-hour course. We can take anybody on this course. Um, coaching for Mathematical Resilience, you learn to self-coach and peer coach. To keep yourself safe, you learn a few coaching skills. So it's a level one coaching course. It's not a maths course. You do do a little bit of maths because you need to learn how to learn maths safely. And it's dual led by a coach and a maths teacher. And you, you model protecting yourself through that whole 24 hours. And we can run that course for any group of 8 to 15 participants online. So if you, any of you want to try this out, we can offer you a course between now and July. We've got Telma here to help run it, and we can offer it for free if it's virtual. We also do one-to-one -one work with individuals, whether they're support staff, parents, older learners. In terms of um, low, medium, high, and severe maths anxiety. In my 13 years of doing this work, I've only met three people I can't help, but I need to refer them to specialists. And usually it's someone who won't come anywhere near me because their terror 
is general. It's not just about mathematics. But there are people who come to me metaphorically dressed up in pieces of armour, which they then take off when they get in the room. I've got a lovely diagram from somebody who was told to come and talk to me for um, some PhD student videos we were making. I'm not going there, it's maths. And she dressed up in her armour and turned up and she had to take the layers off as she relaxed. That's all obviously a metaphor. But, um, so we, we were supporting teachers with practitioner research. We had the conference last July. We launched the Mathematical Resilience Network. Together with your help, every single one of you, we need to develop the shared language of mathematical safeguarding enabling learners to say when they're in their red zone or their orange zone or their green zone or their blue zone and encouraging communities that do not leave people behind and develop growth mindsets. And by growth mindset, I don't mean you must try harder. I mean we've got to give you a chance to grow those neurons. And this is just a last comment from some mums in Leamington. They thought they were the only ones who felt physically sick before a maths lesson and were stupid. They really found the approach of safeguarding helpful and they hadn't thought about the idea of healing a maths trauma that they'd carried for decades. And the summary from the lady who talked to these mums is everybody needs to hear this message so that we can get this third of the population to be effective teachers, parents, police, nurses, anything where we're short of people who can think and work mathematically. And there's a, a list of further reading. Thank you very much. Uh, question, comments? <coughs> um, just a question on first. Um, I teach in a college of education training, and so some of the learners will present themselves, and in, in some cases, some of them do not complete their junior certificates. So that would mean that, for example, they may not have basic algebra, substitution, kind of factorize. And in the course that they do, they're maybe two hours a week in maths, but they're almost immediately in trying to stuff like the marvelous theorem, integration, calculus. Um, and it's you have very limited time with the learners, very limited contact time. Plus as well, um, you have learners presenting with a range of personal issues as well. Um, from your experience with FET learners, um, is it difficult to find the time to use stuff like the relax relaxation response by Robert Benson? Um, because I find, particularly part of my colleagues, is that their focus is almost immediately on the assessment, the system design of the course and the way um, we have in our QQI um, certification. It's maybe the focus is on assessment, assessment, assessment. I know that's uh, counterproductive towards. Um, Interesting. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to talking with you later. Um, they are products of the culture in which we teach, are they not? And if they can come to understand that if they could feel safer in the, in the green or the orange space, then the rate at which they would learn maths would be so much faster then we can make the time. And um, there's a, a, a teacher called Masha. In fact, Tom was also going to talk about doing this as well. If you do it with young people who don't realise that they've got math anxiety, you can get some resentment. Why are we doing psychology when we need to do maths? Yeah? Because they're feeling under pressure. But if there are people in the group who have math anxiety, they are very relieved to learn these messages. And the reason I'm brave enough to come and talk to a bunch of maths teachers um, where there isn't so much mass anxiety, is that they are most likely going to be supporting learners in the future in some guise or other, and they need to hear the message from the point of view of supporting the learners that they're going to be work and not become one of these lecturers that doesn't put the rungs in and, do and doesn't understand that the student might need a break and you have to stop talking maths if they're in their red zone. But in terms of the learners you're describing... No, there hasn't been time made for it. I suggest that the time to make time for these courses is in the end of the summer term and the pre-course before they start, that, that you could fit in a 24-hour four-hour course in a week before they come on their maths course, and that then they're equipped to go and ask for help from these support staff 
and to know that they're not stupid, they just need to carry on in the, in the orange zone. But if you don't do it, like in England with the 80% the of maths failures that we're harming again, we are doing harm. And I think as maths teachers, we have to stop doing harm and start recognising that these kids need to be safeguarded. Does that answer your question? A lot of times they've left mainstream education and when we go back in, they're kind of reinforcing that they're not going to pass. Yeah. And it's compounding the maths and learning like yeah, so I think We have to have a complete rethink for them, yeah. So, so I can send you the paper that Masha and I are working on. That's with an FE group of adults. There are only eight of them, but she wanted to see if it worked or not because she was suitably suspicious. And it worked so well, she, she carried on trying to use it. And what the, what the adults said in that group was, we think everybody should learn these models because I'm not stupid. And, and that was a big message for them. I'm just panicking. Yeah? Thanks a lot. Cheers. Hi, um, I'm just wondering, what did you think of your Prime Minister when he said he wants to choose compulsory mass for 12 to 18 year olds in the UK? Oh, bless you. What a good question. <laughs> um, I would add to your comment that our Ofsted says, which is the inspection system in England, um, says it, the solution to maths anxiety is to do more maths. So there is a lack of awareness. So unless I can persuade um, Mr Sunak and his colleagues that it's a really good idea for everyone to do more maths, but they have to do the safeguarding course first, or the maths resilience work first, He's going to be wasting a lot of public money. And you'll see from the reaction in the press in the UK, some people, particularly the arts people who avoid maths like the plague, have reacted very angrily to the idea that maths is possibly that important. But they wouldn't do that if, if we had a reading problem. They'd want everybody to learn to read. But until we can understand that this problem is for 30% of the population, all the parents who, who can't help their kids with eight-year-old maths, and there's a lot of them, 16% the Open University found, um, and who are worried about passing their anxiety on to their children. We've got to have this conversation at a national level and say that there are, um, are solutions to it and that you can't carry on harming people. And Sunak himself is somebody who probably comes from the left-hand end of the spectrum from my, what I've read about his history and wouldn't understand maths anxiety but might understand other kinds of anxiety but we've got to do some work with them, haven't we? Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what is your experience uh, um, in evaluating uh, um, uh, gender differences uh, in, uh, in mathematical anxiety? And if you think of my strategies to support women in approaching mathematics? What a, another good question. Um, I don't know if you've come across Shirley Conran, but um, she's set up the Mass Anxiety Trust in the UK. She's a very strong, well-known feminist. She used to work for the Daily Mail, and she's produced um, mass resources for girls. I think that it's, it's actually a type difference disguised as a gender difference. So you get um, empathetic girls, you get empathetic boys, you get systemizing girls, you get systemizing boys, and I think, um, okay, there's more empathetic girls, but there's still a lot of empathetic boys. So you still get mass anxiety in males. Um, and so I've offered you that, that, that other way of looking at it. But in terms of gender, absolutely. Um, there are stereotypes. Maths isn't for girls. Um, we talk about mathematicians, whereas actually we need to talk about people who use mathematics in their daily life. And their teachers and doctors, like, like um, the previous speakers did, their teachers and doctors and nurses, they're people who care who need to be able to use maths skills to do that caring job even more effectively. So I, th I think what we'll find is if the more we talk about um, growing those systemizing skills and growing those empathizing skills and including girls in that, the better. But you know when I talked about autonomous motivation, what we found with girls when you're using technology or maths, we have to show that the applications have human value for the majority of those girls to want to be involved. So that's another really good question. Thank you very much. I am an applied math student and I give grinds and one of my grind students has been struggling with maths anxiety and he goes to these classes outside of school with his maths teacher and I would say he's probably in the red zone in those times 
and he's still going and going and going. And when he comes to me for grinds, he's probably in the orange zone, so he's learning, but he's making mistakes, but he's making connections. What would you advise for the classes outside of school? Should he avoid them, or should he keep going and hope that he becomes relaxed and makes connections, or...? <laughs> okay, so, so one of my PhD students, Jana, focused on working with the individual learner rather than with all the teachers and trying to change the whole system around the learner, because the learner needs to how to safeguard themselves. I think you want to give the learner autonomy in a situation like that. I would explain the models to him, or you ask us to, because Tamara and I can explain them to him if you want to just join in, if you're happy using them, and say, is this safe for you to go to a lesson where you're in the red zone and you're not hearing anything because you're wasting your time, which could be more effectively spent somewhere else in the orange zone. He's obviously quite desperate, um, but the fact that you can't hear and process things when you're in the red zone and you feel stupid is, is, is A, wasting his time and B, undermining all the work that you're doing. And I would also try and contact that teacher and get them to understand the difference between the red zone and the orange zone as well. And again, Talma and I will help you with that if you want the help, because we're really keen to spread what we think is a relatively simple, accessible model so that people stop doing harm of that kind. Because why would... Well, if he thought about it like this, why would he spend all that time in his red zone? So interesting. Uh, I'm at the university. I'm in the process of trying to... Um, sorts of resources to help the students there with 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 mass anxiety but also the, the, the tutors there to help support students with mass anxiety. And so I mean obviously everything you've given was, was of so much interest. But I suppose the, the, the thing I want to ask is because obviously we're working with adult learners and we know that there is high levels of mass anxiety within the students within the Open University because they're often at that later stage of life trying to trying to gain those for higher education qualifications that you didn't get a chance to earlier in life. Um, how, how, how would you go about approaching adult learners and they're supporting, supporting adult learners as opposed to, to, to supporting children? I mean, I've been looking at what, what you're talking about, but I'd like your opinion. Well, the answer to my question, Susan, is we either can work with them in a group or one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. um, the, the whole project with Brazil, building bridges with Brazil, is, is to extend this work beyond Ireland and, and UK to other, other parts of the world um, and to, to export these tools to Brazil. Um, mm -hmm. And what we're doing is getting the two Brazilian visitors to understand the one-to-one -one and, and, the, and the group intervention. So we can offer you a group intervention for those adults, which would be the Coaching for Mass Resilience course, um, if they would do it. Or we can offer one-to-one -one work for them to understand the models. Um, if we were talking to an institution, we'd offer the group intervention because it's easier to get a group together. Um, mm. We're aware that people um, think they haven't got time to do these things. But if you have a 24-hour course and you then change your pass rate from 20 to 80%, why wouldn't you make the time? So it's mm. about convincing people that these things work. And that's why we've got so many teachers... Um, working on research programs with us to, to, to check it out in their own context and environments. But just be in touch with me by email, Susan, and ask for any help that you want from the Maths Resilience Network team. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.